All right, so fusion um, is when two atomic nuclei combine into one. And these two nuclei could be anything. So remember, the nucleus of the atom contains protons and neutrons. And those nuclei um, are what uniquely determines what element some atom is. And so when two nuclei combine, that means that it's going from one type of atom to a new type of atom. So going up the periodic table, um, getting larger in mass. Um, and for the process of fission, this is just the opposite. This is when one heavier nucleus, one more massive nucleus, splits into two um, daughter nuclei. And so this process of fission is the uh, way that nuclear reactors here on Earth actually produce energy, and the, also the process that kind of underlies the concept of radioactive dating, uh, because this process of one uh, nucleus falling apart happens at a um, predictable rate. So you can kind of, if you have a sample that contains so much of the parent, then you can count how many of the parents and how many of the daughters exist in a sample, and you can then calculate, kind of backtrack, how long has it been uh, in existence. So this is how we can radioactively date things like uh, rocks and meteors and fossils. All right. So in our kind of general case where we've got two nuclei coming in, producing a third nucleus and some energy, <coughs> The third nucleus um, in the proton-proton chain is actually lighter than nucleus one and nucleus two. And that's because some of the mass of this doesn't end up in the nucleons by themselves, but goes into some other particles. So there can be other products of a fusion reaction other than just that nucleus. And then the final product is, of course, the energy that's released. And that's energy released in the form of light. And this equivalence between mass being converted to energy is kind of encapsulated in the equation E equals mc squared, which is, of course, what Einstein is famous for formulating. Um, and it basically says that that energy um, is kind of you know, latently contained within that mass. And in certain circumstances, in the case of nuclear fusion, it can be released in a different form. So energy is always conserved, and it usually just transforms from one form to another. But this is a one case well, a case in which energy can be produced directly from mass rather than having to come from some other form of energy. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the four fundamental forces because this is kind of necessary to understand why fusion can only happen at high temperatures and pressures. So our four fundamental forces are the strong, weak, electromagnetic, and gravitational force. And we're probably the most familiar with gravitational force, which is what you know holds planet Earth in its orbit around the sun, holds the moon in its orbit around Earth, holds us down on the planet. Um, and so this is a force that is actually, you know, the most noticeable on large scales, but it's also the most weak of the forces in these, of these four. So that might seem a little strange, but it's actually not so strange when you consider that I can, uh, you know, at least temporarily overcome the force of gravity just by jumping, right? So uh, gravity is actually a, a weak force, believe it or not. Uh, the next force that you may be more familiar with is the electromagnetic force. This is what holds the negatively charged electrons in orbit around the positively charged uh, protons in the nucleus. And it's also what's responsible for things like... Um, any sort of touch interactions. Uh, so, you know, the reason I don't fall through my chair that I'm sitting in is actually because there's electromagnetic forces from the chair pushing up against me. So the electromagnetic force is, you know, all around us in here in all the material interactions that we um, experience on a day-to-day -day basis, including chemistry. Okay, so the strong and weak force are a little bit more, uh, I guess, esoteric because they only come up sometimes in the context of uh, nuclear physics. So the weak force is what's responsible for radioactive decay for that fission process where one parent nucleus splits into two daughters. Um, and the strong force uh, binds the nuclei together. So all the protons and neutrons within the nucleus, um, the protons would want to fly apart because they're positively charged. And so the electromagnetic force tends to want to push them apart. Um, so they're only held together because the strong force is stronger than the electromagnetic force, hence its name, I guess. Okay, so how does fusion work if protons want to repel each other? Well, it turns out that if you have protons at a you know, moderate or large distance from each other, that electromagnetic force is the dominant force. Um, but forces can be can have different strengths at different distances. And if you get to within 10 to the minus 15 years of spacing between two protons, then the strong force finally is able to overcome the electromagnetic force, and the uh, protons will be able to. Well, they could they might fuse together, uh, but they could just be held together in the nucleus. So within 10 to the minus 15, um, they're no longer being forced apart by electromagnetic force. But it's really hard to get protons to get that close to each other because you can kind of think of it like if I have two strong magnets, then no matter how much I try, I can't make the magnets um, touch, right? Maybe you've got some strong fridge magnets and you can you know, kind of play with that idea. But if I come in and um, bring my magnets close fast, then I can perhaps uh, have enough kinetic energy to overcome that repulsion. And that's exactly what we're doing in the core of the sun. We're giving protons enough energy because of their high temperature and pressure to bring them close enough to fuse. So this fusion process, that's the reason it can only happen at those high temperatures because it, the proton needs to be moving fast enough to overcome that electromagnetic force, get close enough to the other proton so it can fuse. All right, so um, the, the fusion process in the sun actually doesn't only have uh, one single process. It's actually kind of a cascading process that takes three steps, and this is called the proton-proton chain. So the reason it's a chain is because, well, as you can see, you chain together multiple reactions into the whole kind of grand reaction. And why proton-proton? Because it starts out with protons, or in other words, hydrogen. So a hydrogen atom is just one proton. And the sun starts with the hydrogen as fuel for this process and ends with helium. So the proton-proton chain, um, I want to introduce some of the characters involved here. So first, the nucleons. The hydrogen, again, the proton, is what we're starting out with. This is our raw fuel, and this is the normal isotope of hydrogen. So remember, an isotope is only different by the number of neutrons that it contains. So if you put two hydrogens together and they fuse, then one of those protons actually gets transformed into a neutron, and that, um, now the fused nuclei is called deuterium. So this is otherwise called heavy hydrogen. It's an isotope of hydrogen that has one extra neutron. So our nuclei here, we're starting with hydrogen, ending with deuterium in the first step of our proton-proton chain. And now a couple of other particles that are involved are the neutrino. This is um, an uncharged particle. So unlike the electron, which has a negative charge, the neutrino has no charge. It has very low mass, and it doesn't interact very much with other particles. Um, and then finally, we've got the positron. And this is kind of like an electron, but it's got a positive charge instead of a negative charge. Um, it's actually the electron's antiparticle. So if it uh, pairs up with an electron, then they annihilate each other and produce a uh, gamma ray. All right, so those are all the particles that you're going to encounter in the activity, the hydrogen, deuterium, the neutrino, and the positron. So um, there's a couple of byproducts of the fusion reaction. So you'll notice that some of these uh, particles get used up in uh, kind of the rest of the cascading process, but other particle or other byproducts are free to leave. So the first of these and the most important is the gamma rays. So this is the energy that the fusion process generates, and that's what is eventually going to make its way to the surface of the sun as the sunshine that we see. 
Uh, we don't see these as gamma rays when they emerge from the sun because they lose some energy along the way. We'll talk about that after the activity. And then the neutrinos, they're kind of highlighted here in pink. Um, they don't really interact with things, so they don't get used up in the process of fusion, um, and they escape the sun um, quickly and without changing because they interact with basically nothing. All right, so that's my kind of grand overview of fusion. And the, and the net result of all this is that the sun has a four times 10 to the six watt luminosity. Um, this requires the sun to burn through 600 million tons of hydrogen every second. And that sounds like a lot, and it is a lot. Um, the sun, given its total mass, how much hydrogen it contains, it has enough fuel to keep burning for five billion more years. It's about four and a half billion years old now, so you can think of the sun as kind of a middle-aged star. Um, and if it sounds like a bad thing that the sun will run out of fuel, don't worry, lots of other bad things will happen before that. Like the Earth's core will freeze, we'll lose our magnetic field, and then eventually the planet will cool until uh, the surface is unsurvivable. Then our galaxy will collide with Andromeda, and then the sun will uh, run out of hydrogen. But don't worry. Nothing to be concerned about. 